Give it up for Pastor Parsley. Give it up for this incredible family. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I like his beard. I like I like that those whiskers on his face. I, I told Pastor Camville, I I like that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I I just think we all ought to just raise our hands all the way up on this platform, as if we could touch them. And I want everybody to shout out this prayer. I want you to shout it out. The devil's gonna pay. Big time. We, we take this personal. Any attack upon our pastor. It's an attack upon us. This will not stand. In the name of Jesus, victory is ours. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Shout it out. Shout it out. Shout it out. Hallelujah. Join hands with everyone that's next to you there, if you will, and just join hands. Everybody can tell this is an extraordinary moment. This is an extraordinary time. I, I'm just so full of emotion, you're going to have to give me a moment to get it together here. Because I'm just, my memories are just flooding from the first time I even walked into this city and to this work and this ministry when it was just small and or I should say almost in its infancy so it's just flooding with emotion you know just to think how dare the devil think he's going to succeed in this so let's say this out loud Holy Spirit let us receive what we're to receive this morning in Jesus name help Dwight Thompson to deliver that that the Lord has placed on his heart we humbly ask it in Jesus name everybody shout amen amen and amen and amen Amen. Let me give you something right quickly. Everybody have your Bible, just hold them up real high and shout it out. This is the word of the living God. This is the word of the living God. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, I just ask you to anoint me as I've never been anointed. In the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you may be seated. The Lord bless you here this morning. I, I just want to obey the Holy Spirit. First of all, I want to say just walking in here and seeing this crowd. And seeing all of you, something hit me so strong about this church. I'm just going to walk around a little bit. And... Uh, so, Nell, I want you to stand up and let everybody see you. My beautiful, beautiful bride. How long have we been married? 55 years, isn't it? Is that right? That's just wrong. That just can't be right. It's just wrong. That's just wrong, Zonell. We need to refigure that up. 
and uh, she's an extraordinary lady. She's had her own challenges here for about 15 months, and the Lord is undertaking. We give him the praise and the glory. But there's something I sing about. This just hit me when I saw uh, Pastor uh, uh, Bill here. Are you Canfield? Pastor, but can I just call you Bill, Pastor Bill? And so I saw his beard, and then I saw Pastor. Well, I, I just want to relate something uh, in uh, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 19. Don't, you don't have to turn to it. I'll just kind of uh, phrase it like this. And there's a man in there by the name of Mephibosheth, and, and uh, uh, the king's been gone. King David's been away. He had departed. And so it says that uh, Mephibosheth, when he saw him, they noticed him. He hadn't shaved. He hadn't taken care of himself. He hadn't trimmed his hair. All the things necessary, he said, I vowed when my king left, I would not do any of these things until my king returned. Well, I want to tell you something. There is a spirit in this room that sends a message to the devil. We will not stop until our pastor is back in that pulpit preaching under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I want to speak to you for a few minutes out of Exodus, the 18th, uh, the 17th chapter. It's only 10 verses of Scripture, but I want you to just let me read it and then let me comment about it. May I do that? So everybody just listen real closely to this because this is a defining moment. And of all the things that this church has done, this will be a defining moment that will send a strong message, not only to the enemy, but to people across the nation. Can you imagine, in these 52 years that I've been an evangelist, can you imagine how many churches I've been in? And can you imagine, if you will please, what it would be like to see so many different dramas that have taken place in these churches? And the things that I've seen you could write volumes about. And you could write things about when tragedy and challenge would hit a church, how the congregation responded. But this church has raised the bar to a new level. And this is sending, I believe, the most defining message of anything this church has ever done. None is greater because you see, this church is saying when our pastor has been attacked, the devil didn't just attack him. We take that personal. We're not in this just to see if he's back in a day or two or a week and pretty soon everybody, uh uh. We want the devil to know we're in this thing until the finish. And until he's back preaching under that dynamic anointing of the Holy Spirit, you pick on our pastor, you pick on every one of us. Verse 8, now Amalek came and he fought with Israel in Rephidim. Chapter 17, verse 9. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. And tomorrow, I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. I don't know why I just wanted to underscore rod. That just seemed to confirm what the Lord laid on my heart. So he said, I'm going to go stand on top of that hill with the rod of God in my hand. Rod partially is in the hand of God, by the way. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was, verse 11, that when Moses held up his hand, 
that Israel prevailed. Both hands, just lift them up with your Bible and just throw your hands up for a moment. Let's just get the message. When the hands were lifted, Israel prevailed. The hands are lifted. Rod Parsley's healing victoriously will be not only complete, but the voice and the vocal cords will be stronger than they've ever been before. And then when he let down his hands, the enemy prevailed, Amalek prevailed. Now watch this. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and they put under it. And he sat on it. Now here comes the church. This is representative of you. His hands got tired. But the church, World Harvest Congregation. Oh, I feel a shout coming on. <laughs> and Aaron and her, though, they came and they supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady. And how long did they hold up the hands? How long did they do it? The scripture said they held up the hands of Moses until the sun went down. Well, the sun hasn't gone down yet. And what we want the devil to know and the world to know, we will hold up the hands of the servant of God until the hands, let them be weary, but until the sun goes down, we're in this thing for the distance. Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Verse 14, then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book. History is being made today. Write it down and remember this day. Write that down. Moses said, to the Lord said, write it down for a memorial in the book. If I were you, I'd just put down the date right now into the fly leaf of your Bible or right there in the margin of your Bible of this, these verses of Scripture. Exodus 17, verses 8 through 16. Just write it somewhere in the margin, the date. Then the Lord said to you and I today, this morning in World Harvest, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua or in the hearing of Rod Parsley and this family. And this church, write it down, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of all of this attack upon his body. I'm going to blot it down once and for all. This is the word of the Lord that he's bringing to this congregation today. I will write this down. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn and the Lord will have war with Amalek from Genesis to ge generation to generation. I want to make a statement here today. I want to make this statement that the Holy Ghost has placed upon me to make. When they asked me to come and uh, fill in on this Sunday morning and next Sunday, we've been in uh, contact, uh, not, uh, not verbally, but by text and his texts are long <laughs> so he said in one of them I haven't preached so long I don't know when to just shut down here and they're just long so my phone's just loaded down with but it, uh, all through all of this car and despondent for these weeks was the devil's going to pay big time so there wasn't any about poor me or sad me it's oh the devil's going to pay big time and in the latter part of those texts I'm, I'm divulging this he said I've reached a place of peace that I've turned this over to the Lord and I'm here to reaffirm that that the battle is not yours but it is the Lord so let me walk this through for a moment and, and just a paraphrase it. this is a war that we are in this Let's understand what's going on. This is a spiritual 
attack upon your pastor and upon world harvest. This is an attack. Now that attack comes at a very critical time in our history. Our nation's never been in a time quite like this. You, we know that. I don't have to categorize it. But everything from Supreme Court rulings, everything that's going on internationally with a country that is saying it defiantly that in 25 years Israel will not even be on the map, Iran has said it, that a statement that is being made, death to America, but we still give them $150 billion in signs. So let, let's just be honest about it. So our enemies are being armed to the teeth. Anything to kind of pacify all of this, whatever it may be, we're told we're not a Christian nation. Everything that you can imagine, rulings of the Supreme Court, the endangered species in America are born again Christian. They're under fire. So in the midst of all of this tempestuous time and attack, then one of the most powerful voices to America has been attacked. Not his arm. Are you listening to me now? Listen to me. Talk. Everybody just say, I, I get it, Dwayne. Not, not his arm, not, you know, not leg, not some other form of the body, but but his vocal cords, the part that speaks through the foolishness of preaching, what comes out of his mouth is the powerful, uncompromising, no backing down, no backing up, the uncompromising, unfiltered message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, preachers all over this nation are becoming politically correct. Now, stating that is not to make my point stronger. I'm just stating a fact. It's just what's happening. The pressure from the Supreme Court, it's reaching into the pulpits. In one city, the mayor has directed pastors to send their sermons. They're going to preach on Sunday morning and let him sign off before they're to preach it. This is a fact. It's taking place. In other words, it isn't just God that some generic God that's up there. Anybody can use that. But the lightning rod, what sets it on fire is to invoke the name that is above every name. The name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Let me say it. There is no other name given under heaven whereby men might be saved but the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. So Rod Parsley has been attacked in the vocal cord to shut down the message. shut it down and you are aiding and abetting his ministry you people are troublemakers you do know you're sitting in a church that has the reputation that the man that pastors this church does not run outside to discover what everybody wants to hear you do know that, don't you? He doesn't take polls and to find out what's popular. He doesn't filter the message. In other words, he has a clear mandate from heaven that he is not to follow the compromising church that's happening in the world today. Many churches won't even use the word sin anymore. Many churches won't even talk about judgment anymore. Many churches want you to think, you're okay, I'm okay, everything's okay, we're all okay. But here comes a Rod Parsley that says, wait a minute, the whole counsel of God says, 
that there will be many that will say, Lord, Lord, but will not enter the kingdom of God. So I, I want to just, I just want to say things on a personal level now for a moment. This church is designated by God to be a voice. And the words that Paul would preach to the young Timothy would be preach the word. For the day will come when there will be those that will go out with itching ears or ears craving to find somebody in a pulpit that will affirm their lifestyle. So this, the greatest attack is not only from without, but it's also from within. And so we have pulpits filled with preachers that have become puppets that will not go against being politically correct. Well, so my, my privilege of being with this family would be before he and First Lady Joni were married. So this was really emotional when they walked out here a while ago. Because there was no uh, Ashton. And there was no Austin. And there wasn't even, he wasn't even a married uh, man. They were engaged. So when he asked me to come in the farmer building over here and I, I walked in, and uh, the singing, just like this morning, you just felt like you were going to get raptured. <laughs> I mean, it was just amazing. And I'm sitting there never, never, uh, thank you, thank you, Elder, and never being here before. Well, this was back, I'm trying to say, almost 30 years. Would that be pretty close? And I said, I know if you'll give me a chance, red dress, I'm going to get to that. She's, she's, she's telling me, and you stayed in our, in our home. I'm coming to that right now. And I stayed in their home. And so it was just, I'm sitting there, you know, in this house. And, and this mother, Holy Ghost, devil stomping. I believe that the mother of this preacher, Ellen Parsons, I believe still when she gets up, the devil says, you demons better wake up. She's on her feet and there's going to be trouble. So this woman of God, I'm sitting there and you know I'm staying in her house. And I have just been in a service to where when Rod got up the first time that I ever heard anything come out of his mouth, I mean, he was skinny, and he had a kind of an afro-looking hair thing. He really was. If he were to stand sideways and stick out his tongue, he'd look like a zipper. Now, I don't know where that came from. That just sort of uh, cut, that, cut that out of the tape. You know? But then when they got through with the singing, he took the pulpit, and he started just talking. And I'm telling you, I can remember it like yesterday. Now, this is nearly 30 years ago. The hair had sent up on my arm. Yeah. I mean, there was an anointing of God upon him. And I knew then, as God is my witness, I knew then that I was in the presence of a extraordinary, special one that has set us, been set aside that all of my ministry combined will pale by comparison to where God was going to take this young, powerful voice. People, this is a historic moment in this church's history and in this nation's history. That is why, I just want to get this out, I don't care what price I have to pay. 
We've been praying for him all of these days. My wife will tell you every meal we can't get it out. Every morning we get up in devotion. The last thing on our lips is included in Ross Parsley's total complete deliverance and the hand of God upon the World Harvest Church and that God will fulfill the destiny that he has called you. God will fulfill the call. God will fulfill. It may be delayed temporarily. But it will be fulfilled in the name of Jesus. Well, well, the power of God would fall in those meetings. And then I, I would go sit. And I asked, uh, I asked Clyde. Clyde that's in heaven. I mean, I have people say, I think he's just my favorite parsley. You couldn't get around him without just loving him. I mean, he, you know, he smoked every once in a while. Well, I just, he does. He just, you know. And there were times, you know, I'd see him. He'd be nervous. And I'd go outside with him. He and I'd just light up. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> and there was a while in one of those, sir, he says, he'd say, buddy, I'm going back to the free will Baptist. <laughs> he, he was just an, he was just an extraordinary. But everywhere you look. Now, listen to me closely. I see his handprint. Every building, he's the builder. Every brick, he could walk inside this. I uh, said this to some folks in the, in the green room a while ago. He could walk in this building that was being built, and he could spot something half a mile away, it seemed like. And uh, No, no, that's not right. We've got to change. And he could keep, he overseed this in everything you see on this property. Clyde's hand prints her. The dad was all over. And the combination of that praying devil stomping mama. And then that, that builder for God. And then here comes a beautiful first lady, Joni, along the way. This, this extraordinary... Isn't she beautiful and isn't she elegant? Just so, so elegant so, and so anointed. And to see how God has brought this whole... Do you understand where I'm taking this this morning? This whole orchestrated of God family has come together. And then, of course, the first daughter. Wow. The other day, I've, I see her on television, and I go, wow, it's enough to have a mama, and then the son, and then the wife. Now I got to, the devil says, now I got to put up with that daughter, and that elegant daughter, sophisticated and powerful and on fire. And then that Austin, in his own way, is a walking miracle of God. It is a testimony of how you love and adore and see the hand of God in the life of Austin. And the miracle. I cannot put into words what I see when I see this family. Extraordinary. But people, this isn't the church where you can sit back and coast. This is a church stamped with the approval of God to turn this nation. Do you understand that? I, please know when I say that, I know that you do. But I'm just kind of like reminding you, you do understand the impact that you are making upon this nation being a powerful church that declares the uncompromising gospel of the Lord. You do understand that. So with all of that said, and then the enemy walks in and attacks this man of God. Which brings me to my text. 
This is a spiritual war. It's, let's define it as it is. This is a spiritual attack upon this ministry to stop it. And there are fewer and fewer. I, I'll tell you the truth how I feel about it. And I'm, I'm, I'm not just saying this. I, as an evangelist and a man that loves this family and this church, I'm not kidding you. If I could find me a trailer, a real nice one, and bring it up here on the parking lot until he's back in that pulpit. I, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I'll get in here and sweep these floors. Between my meetings, I'll come in here and I'll get over there and mow his yard. Lord, he's got a big yard. I forgot about that when I said that just like that. And Clyde's planted a million trees out there. I'm telling you, if I got to trim that stuff, I'm going to be in a mess. But I'll get Zonel out there to do it. I'm just, the point I'm trying to make, if I've got to stamp, stay here and just camp out on this property, I, it would be a privilege just to walk around this property going, How dare you, devil, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God! How dare you, devil! How dare you, devil! And I want to shout it, the devil's going to pay. The devil's going to pay. The devil's going to pay. Now, let, let me just wrap this up as fast as I can. Let me see what time it is. Right? Am I okay on the time? All right, we'll beat those Baptists to Bob Evans here in just a few minutes. Now, listen to me real close. Now, this Amalek, it's spiritual warfare. Now, this... Let's get the picture now. This is really, really important in my spirit. Spiritual warfare. God spoke to me and said, I want you to go into that battle and I want you to fight the enemy. So it's a fight, isn't it? Everybody shout. It's a fight. Everybody show me a fist. Get them. Come on, just get them. So this thing is a fight. It's a warfare, isn't it? It's a warfare. We've been attacked. This is a warfare. And we're taking it very personal you attack Pastor Parsley you attack me you attack my wife and you're attacked aren't we we're all attacked and this will not stand I want Rod Parsley to let he and his family to know this is not going to stand the devil's not just fighting him he's fighting every one of us that's my message now now watch this he said now you go and fight then the spirit of the Lord came upon Moses and Moses would say I'm going to go on up now, now watch this you first win it in the spiritual realm before you begin to see it in the natural realm. Everybody got that? So, so we have to understand where the real power is. The real power is not in the numbers. Because eventually out of 32,000 with Gideon, he wound up with 300. Has nothing to do with the numbers. Because see, God's not going to let anybody get the glory. He'll take the 300 to go ahead and defeat the tens of thousands because only he is going to get the glory. So he's going to fight this enemy where he's so outnumbered, Joshua is. Moses said the, the real battle is going to be fought in the spiritual realm. So I'm going to the top of the hill, he said. And when I get to the top of the hill, I'm taking with me the rod of God. So on the top of the hill, with the rod of God, Moses does this. Hands lifted, and the rod of God in his hand. And when his hands were uplifted, Israel, Joshua, prevailed in the battle. Let's do it one more time, everybody. Hands up like this. Okay. Those hands are up for Rod Parsley right now. And we're going to hold on. 
But now, sometimes your hands get tired, don't they? They get tired of you. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead and take them down, children. So you, then you put your hands down. But it says when the hands went down, the enemy prevailed. So then they came up, reinforcement. So I'm making two become many hundreds and uh, whatever, several thousand. So Aaron and her, uh, they go up there with him because he's going to need some support. And Rob Parsley has a great support system in the warriors seated in this congregation today. Hallelujah! And so, and so now then here comes Aaron and here comes her. And they find this stone for uh, Moses to sit down on. And so he sits down and they get him all propped up here. And just do it any way you have to. And then those hands went back up and they put stones under there to kind of get them supported. But it said Aaron came to this side and held up his arm. And then her came up to the other side and look at this picture. He couldn't hold him up by himself. So here comes Elder Bob and comes Elder Canfield. And, well, I wish I could call all of your names and because I'd call every one of them if I knew how to do it. I'd, I'd read the list of heroes sitting in this room today. I would read the list of absolute don't mess with my pastor. Don't mess with my pastor. And so here comes the entire congregation of Well Harvest Church. And therein lies the power. The power was the God connection. The power that when the hands are lifted, you're in contact with God. And the power that this World Harvest Church has are the men and the women sitting here this morning that have made a declaration in the presence of God. We will never let his hands fall down until our pastor is back in the pulpit. Never, never, never. I've never in all of my ministry, my wife will tell you, never in the hundreds and thousands of churches I've ever been in, I've never sensed an anointing that you sense when you walk in here. This pastor, he's just different. He's a, he's a troublemaker. He, he, he doesn't let you stay comfortable becoming, becoming a normal status quo Christian. And so now I think about this. I think about all of our kids uh, and our grandkids and our now great two of our two great grandchildren that we have. Dear God, don't help we look. Too, too young to have great grandchildren. Thank you for your support, by the way. But I was thinking about, no, I was thinking about this just more today than ever, just coming back and then seeing them. This is where I would want all of my family to go. Because this man, is looking out for your soul and he would look out for my grandchildren. Now think about this. 
He dedicates your babies. He dedicates them. He marries you. I got that in the wrong order. He marries you. I got it back in the biblical. Work with me. He marries you and then he, then he dedicates your babies. And then you're sick. He tells the devil to get his hands off of your body. In no certain terms. Oh, he still believes in divine healing. Then he, and then he, he's there when you're sick. And then those that go on to heaven, he's there. He, he buries you. In other words, he's watching like a watchman over checking it out he doesn't say everything maybe you want to hear but then if that's what he did he wouldn't be any different than all the rest so in other words here's the deal he looks out and he sees you his people if you were to ask him this is my observation, but if you were to ask him, I know it's correct. If he had, what would be his number one passion for the people of whom God has placed him overseer? And that would be first to know every one of you will be ready for the greatest event the world has ever known. And that's the return of the King of Kings. And Lord. But then in addition to that, while you're here, that you will fulfill God's divine purpose and call for your life. You will be all God wants you to be. But then he's also going to tell you, when you're getting off track, he's going to come say, now, wait a minute. You're, you're moving there to a dangerous edge. You're, you're in a dangerous spot there. You're getting too close. In other words, he's not preaching to give you a line to see how close you can get to the world. I saw a well-known preacher, and I'm just going to say it. I'm just, I'm just going to get it out. Nobody believes in grace more than this preacher. But I'm getting a little tired of too many preachers saying, go on out there and sin all you want to. Well, I want to tell you one thing. My Bible talked about a Jesus didn't only talk about blessing you and what he would do, but he also sent out the warnings to tell you, don't get over there close to that sin. Sin is destructive. Sin can destroy. Sin will keep you from, from fulfilling God's purpose for your life. Don't talk about how close we can get to the world. Oh, don't write me any of your letters. Brother, I'm sick and tired of too many talking about how we can run around in the world all we want to. Let me tell you something. When you become a born again child of God, your mind isn't about wanting to see how you can run out there and live like the devil when you know Jesus Christ you want to see how close you can get to Jesus Christ. So my message to you today in conclusion is simply this. This isn't predicated upon some emotion. It's predicated upon my unshakable 
Listen to me, church. Determination. If ever I wanted to run up on the toppest pinnacle of this temple and shout it, there's still a people left. There's still a people that go to church that's not in the mood to compromise, not in the mood to back up, not in the mood to quit, not in the mood to see how close we can get to the world, not in the mood to see that we can still go live like a devil and call ourselves born again Christians, but there's still a people that wants to back a pastor that said, I'm gonna preach the uncompromising message of Jesus Christ. I'm gonna preach it if you mean it. Stand to your feet and clap your hands. Don't panic, take but clap your hands. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah! Brother Canfield, come join me on the platform, if you will, please. As long as Moses' hands were lifted, the battle for Israel prevailed. And as long as we hold our hands up, we're saying to God and to Pastor Parsley and to Joni and to Ashton and Austin and Ellen and to all of you, we're letting the world know we will stand with our hands raised until our pastor walks back into that pulpit to preach the gospel. Now I cut this short right here for a reason. I don't want to hold you too long, but I want to make this statement. I've cut this short. Number one, I want every man, woman, boy, and girl that says Dwight Thompson. I've always loved this pastor. I've always loved this church. But I realize something's going on in our world that this is the time for me. Not only just to come to church. Way down inside, something's happened to me this morning. That I want to sell out everything for Jesus Christ. I don't want my mind on things like, oh, I think I'll just follow from afar off. I want to give my life to God. I want God to send His Holy Spirit and go inside me and search me and take out everything in my life that prevents me from being all out for Jesus Christ. You have hidden sin. You've got that weakness, that proclivity, that propensity to every now and then, oh, you just give in to it and run on out. After all, I don't need to worry about it anymore. No, no. You have that one thing. There's a line that says, whatever you do not master in your life will ultimately rise up to master you. So you say, Dwight Thompson, I've got that thing in my life. I want God to set me free. Folks, you don't want to miss the greatest event. And at the rate we're going right now, I believe with all of my heart, Jesus Christ can come at any moment at any moment. So every man, woman, boy, and girl in this building that says, Dwight Thompson, I just have something in my life. I want the Holy Ghost to come and take it out. Everything in my life, anything in my life that I'm hiding, 
anything that I'm even blinded to, I want Him to take it out. And I want to be all I can be for God. 1,000%. Dwight, I've got something in my life. And I want to make it all right with God. No heads bowed. No eyes closed. You say, what will everybody think? Well, they'll think it's wonderful. Because all of us have sinned. And all of us have come short of the glory of God. Well, I, I brought my best friend with me. What will they think? Well, it's good to have an earthly friend. It's not good enough to go to hell with them. So you might as well tell them I like you a lot, but not that much. So you might as well come on and go to heaven with me because that's where I'm going. I want every man, woman, boy, and girl that says, get to it, Dwight. Lead me in that prayer. I have something in my life I want God to take it out. When I count to three, you want this prayer. Raise your hand as high as you can get it. Hands are already going up. But I've got something in my life I need to make it right with God. On three, raise your hand. One, two, three, put it up. All over this building. Elder Canfield, you can see it. Many, 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 many hands are raised. Just keep raising them and hold them there right now. Hold them there right now. Now I want everybody in this building now to raise both hands. And I want you to pray this from the bottom of your heart. From the bottom of your heart. Lord Jesus, I'm not playing church. I'm not playing games. I'm dead serious. I want you to go into my heart. Search me. Cleanse me. Wash me. Take everything that's in my life that is not pleasing to you. Weaknesses. Sins. Shortcomings. Take them out of my life. And set me free. I want to be what God wants me to be. And Lord, I pledge my faith, my determination, my perseverance, my tenacity, 1,000% to hold up the hands of my pastor until he's back in that pulpit. We will not falter. We will not quit. We're in this for the duration. Thank you, Lord, for setting me aflame. In Jesus' name, everybody shout amen, amen, and amen. Clap your hands, church. Clap your hands.